This is a Saddleback Church podcast. The Lord also said to Moses, Give the following instruction to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 19, verses 1 and 2. Genesis begins the story of humanity and the God who wanted a family to love and to love him. Exodus offers the first look at the lengths God will go to care for his people on a grand scale. Leviticus, the third book of the Bible, shows us the lengths God will go to care for his people on a personal scale. Leviticus is ultimately about relationship. It is a holy God telling the people of Israel how they can be in relationship with him despite the brokenness of sin. It's an extraordinary book in teaching about who God is and who we are. Now, Leviticus has a reputation of being a rather difficult or tedious book. And it's honestly one that many people skip when they are reading through their Bibles. But as we navigate through Leviticus today, believe me when I tell you that my guest will make you want to dive into Leviticus headfirst and see it in a new, exciting way. So to help us navigate Leviticus is Dr. J. Sklar. He is a professor of Old Testament and author of not one, but two commentaries on Leviticus. In this conversation, Jay gives the best explanation I have ever heard about why we shouldn't skip Leviticus, but instead see it through new lenses that will make you see Leviticus in a new way. All right, Dr. Jay Sklar, thanks for joining me today. Jay, we are talking about Leviticus. Now, for somebody who has studied the book of Leviticus for, you know, 10, 15 years, as long as you have, yeah. what is maybe a, a, maybe a, a, a lesson that kind of stands out to you? What is something that, that just stands out to you, especially because people will probably listen and go like, okay, I want to hear from a guy who studied this book for so long. Yeah, well... Thank you, Jason. There have been a lot of lessons that have come to me over the past 15 years, but one of the biggest ones has been that if you are at a dinner party and you are wanting to get out of a conversation, if you just mention to people you've been studying Leviticus for 15 years, it works like a charm <laughs> every single time. Uh, and when you do that, what I've learned, people look at you in one of a couple ways. Sometimes they look at you with this really dazed look as though they're wondering either what in the world is Leviticus or why in the world would you study it for 15 years? <laughs> and then other people, they get this smile on their face. And it's the kind of smile that says, oh, well, at least he's not hurting anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would imagine it's a very easy way to get the the polite nod, uh huh, and then the back turn, and they talk That's, to some. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that many times over the years. <laughs> now that there are a lot of wonderful lessons that I've learned, and I'm sure we'll get into some of those as we go along here. Yes, and I mean, and it serves such a wonderful purpose because without people who've studied Leviticus, we wouldn't get to do this episode of this podcast today. Right. So I am grateful for your 15 years in this book. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, I am, I am as well. So, so we are looking at Leviticus today from a primer type standpoint, a how do we navigate this book, an introduction to Leviticus, how, information to help people people as they are maybe reading Leviticus or who are about to start reading it maybe for the first time. So if we can, let's start with the basic details. Let's start with, do we know, and I have to ask it this way because it's not always true, do we know who wrote this book and when, and then how does what we know or don't know about the author affect how we read the book? 
Right. Well, on the one hand, there's no place in Leviticus that says this was written by fill in the blank. Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, at least 36 different times, we read something like, which translates to, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, and then you've got this whole long chapter mm. that is direct speech from the Lord. In fact, if you've ever seen those, um, if you've ever seen a Bible that puts the letters of Jesus or the words of Jesus in red letters, yeah. if you did that for Leviticus and put all of the wor words of the Lord in red letters, Leviticus would be mostly red because mm. it's, all of this direct speech from the Lord, but that he first gave to Moses. So our assumption is quite naturally, well, Moses is the one from which we're getting the, the material here in Leviticus from the Lord through Moses to us. And that has huge implications for how we read it. Mm. So let me put it as a question. Sometimes I'll ask my students, you know, when you sit down to read a book like Leviticus, what's the most important question to have in mind? And if you'd asked me that as a young Christian, I would have said something like, what does this book mean for me today? Sure. Like, that'd be the, the most important question that I, I would have had in my mind. And that's a good question, but it's not the most important one. The most important question is this. What would this have meant to an Israelite who's just been rescued from Egypt and who's headed towards the promised land under Moses? Mm -hmm. In other words, you always want to be asking when you're reading the Bible, who was the original audience and what might this have meant to them? And you want to start there because if you're going to understand a text well, uh, you have to begin with the original context. So let me give you an example. You're reading through Leviticus and you get to chapter three, and it's all about a sacrifice called the fellowship offering mm -hmm. or sometimes translated the peace offering. And as you read through the instructions for how to make a fellowship sacrifice, you read this emphasis on the fact that all the fat must be burned to the Lord. Yeah. You know, and you and I are reading that and we're like, what is this? Look, a, an ancient Israelite fat-free diet. Yeah. The Lord was, <laughs> you know, this must be for health reasons or something like that. But in actuality, that's not at all the reason why the Lord says this. The Lord says this because in ancient Israel, the fat was considered the very best part of the meat. Uh, it's, uh, think today, why do we add fat to food? Because it, it makes it taste sweeter or yeah. better. Yeah. Or uh, think of our phrase, the cream of the crop. You know, you might look at some, some beans and say, oh, these beans are the cream of the crop. But they're beans. They're not cream. What? <laughs> but cream for us in that context means the very best. And so in Leviticus, when it's saying, make sure you burn all the fat to the Lord, it's because it's the very best. Mm. And the Israelites were to learn, as we are today, oh, the Lord is worthy of our very best. Mm. And that becomes clear when you begin to think like an ancient Israelite and start with them as the audience. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that it's such a great reminder that you are entering into this context that as you are reading, especially these these early Old Testament books, as you are stepping into that place and that time and seeing God's word played out in this situation. So it all means something a little bit different. It still means stuff to us today, but yeah. we have to take it in that context as well. Yeah, someone has once said before, the Bible was written for us, but it wasn't written to us, yeah. meaning it was originally Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, these, these books were written to ancient Israelites. You know, Romans was written to first century Jews and, and Greeks in Rome. And so it wasn't written to us, but it certainly has been written for us. We're still to learn today from what the Lord was saying to his, uh, his followers those many years ago. Yeah, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I think that was a John Walton quote who's been a guest on this podcast before. So uh, okay. I, I love that quote. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so we've talked about uh, about who wrote this book. We can take pretty good assertion that it came from Moses. It was a lot of God saying, and the Lord spoke to Moses, and then we get the book of Leviticus through that way. So if you can, how can you describe this book in one sentence? <laughs> 
one sentence. Let me give you the sentence and then I'll unpack color it. commentate. On yeah. It. <laughs> the sentence would be a holy God teaches his people how to live in his presence and reflect his holiness into the world. A holy God teaches his people how to live in his presence and how to reflect his holiness into the world. So to break that apart, a holy God teaching his people how to live in his presence, that aspect of living in the presence of God is so important to understand when you're reading through these first books of the Bible. In fact, when you read through the Bible as a whole, if you think of the first couple chapters, Genesis 1 and 2, what do you see? God dwelling with his people who live in this beautiful, pain-free land of goodness, justice, peace, provision. That's how the Bible begins. If you think about the last two chapters of the Bible, what do you see? God living with his people mm -hmm. in this beautiful land of peace, goodness, justice, provision. I mean, that's how the Bible begins and ends. And it teaches us a lot about what God's intent for humanity is to live in his presence. Mm -hmm. And so then when you come to a book like Leviticus, what is it that you see? Well, leading into Leviticus, he's talking about um, why he led his people out of Egypt. And he says this, uh, they will know that I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. God desires to be near his people. Why are they supposed to build the tabernacle? He says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. This is God's desire. And so to, to think of Leviticus is to think of a book that is describing, you know, fleshing out for us God's desire for, for us to be near him and for him to be near us. Mm. But not just to be near him, the last part of our sentence said, live in his presence and reflect his holiness into the world. So in other words, he's calling his people, God's a God of goodness, justice, mercy, and love. These things flow from him uh, like a river. They burst out of him like out of a geyser. Mm. And what he's wanting of his people is to reflect those same things into the world so that the world can get a sense of who God is and what he's made us as human beings to do and to be able to experience the goodness, justice, mercy, and love for which we've been created. From that angle, Leviticus and this is not how we typically think of it, but Leviticus is a very missional book mm. because the mission of God to reflect his character into the world is made so clear in this book, and it helps us as his followers to know how to do that. What I love is we're looking at the context of this book with the other Old Testament books that we've already talked about with Genesis and Exodus is I love how in Genesis we see, we get this almost like, you know, this one chapter scene of God in the garden with Adam and Eve and what that relationship of with looks like. And then we quickly get to the brokenness of that. And we still get these narrative stories of God in a relationship. It's almost like God and Abraham, God and Isaac, God and Jacob. And then that carries through into the Exodus. And then from the moment of the Israelites leaving Egypt and moving into this Exodus period, we get this change from God and to God with the, with the Israelite people. And then you start to then, what, what Leviticus does is it gets to focus in, bring that attention to what does God with mean? As you said, we get this, it's these instructions for how people can live with God about the tabernacle, all these, all these things of what it means to live with God. So I love how, how Leviticus almost takes a magnifying glass onto this period and be like, okay, here's how that works. Here's how with works. Yes, exactly. And then you go forward in the story and God describes his name as Emmanuel, mm -hmm. which means with us is God. Yeah. And then you keep going forward in the story and you get to the book of John in the New Testament. And when it's talking about Jesus, this is so fascinating. In the first chapter of John, it says, we have beheld his glory mm -hmm. um, and it describes him as the one who... 
Now, just I'm going to geek out just yeah, for a second please. here. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the tabernacle was known as the skenes. Mm. When you get to John 1, it says that Jesus skenaoed among us. Mm. He tabernacled among us. Uh, so when's the last time that you saw the glory of God appear and a tabernacle be filled? Mm -hmm. Well, before Jesus, it was back in Exodus. That's how the book of Exodus ends. The skenase is filled with the glory of God. And you get to John, and what do we read? When Jesus shows up, he skenaos among us, and we behold the glory of God. Yeah. In other words, God's now in our midst, because from the beginning, his heart's desire has been to be with his people. Mm. So I don't know if you if there is such a thing as a narrative flow through Levitic through Leviticus, but it's a question that I typically ask about this navigating the Bible series. So how would you describe the flow of Leviticus? I'm going to take a step back from that question, <laughs> but and go actually, ahead. because Leviticus, um, one of the reasons why. It is known sometimes as the place where Bible reading plans go to die. <laughs> yeah. It's because it is almost entirely a series of laws. Mm -hmm. Laws on sacrifice, laws on ritual purity, laws on holy living, etc. So there's not much of a narrative flow to the book. However, it's really important to understand how Leviticus fits into the larger narrative flow of the Bible's first five books. Yeah. So let me go there just for a second. In Exodus, the book just before Leviticus, so the Bible begins Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. So in Exodus, what happens? God redeems the Israelites, rescues them from slavery in Egypt. He brings them to Mount Sinai. He says to them, you're going to meet to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He enters into a covenant relationship with them, the, the closest kind of relationship you could enter into with someone who wasn't a family member. Uh, think today of adoption. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that kind, it's, it's a way of entering into a relationship that's way more personal than a contract and way more permanent than an ordinary relationship. So he enters into covenant with them. He says, build me this tabernacle, this huge tent, think wedding size kind of tent. And then at the very end of the book, the very last chapter of Exodus, we read that the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. And if we had been there, what that probably would have looked like would have been this massive cloud that descends, that is uh, lighting up mm. with fire, with lightning, we're hearing thunder, and that's what's just happened. Mm. That God is in our midst. So here's Leviticus. If you are an ancient Israelite, at this point in your history, you have some burning questions. Yeah. You are wondering, how in the world can we live with this God of blazing holiness in our midst as sinful, impure people without being melted mm. because of our impurities? And the answer is Leviticus which begins in the first seven chapters by explaining what different sacrifices are so that you can deal properly with your sin and impurity. The answer is Leviticus, which in chapters 8 through 10 establishes a priesthood and the tabernacle is a functioning place to worship. Uh, the answer is Leviticus, which in mm. chapters 11 through 15 goes on to describe how to cleanse yourself of ritual impurity. The answer is Leviticus, which in chapter 16 talks about Yom Kippur, this great, great day of atonement mm -hmm. in which the Israelites could take care of all their sins and impurities one day in the year. The answer is Leviticus, which in chapters 17 through 27 explains what it means to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So we tend to look at Leviticus today as this burden, I think, for the Israelites it was a lifesaver, mm. a life preserver that helped them to answer some of the most burning questions they would have had. Mm. That's such a wonderful way of framing it and really takes some of the, as you said, burden, but it also it takes away some of that kind of fear or, or confusion. And instead, when you put it in this in this place of time and you're looking at it from the Israelite perspective, you, you can see how important this book 
not just was, but continues to be in that mm-hmm. in, in that setting. So I think we've talked about this a little bit, but I, 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 I want to give you space to expand on it in talking yeah. about the kind of the major theme of Leviticus. Yeah. And if we could, how could, how does knowing this theme in advance, how does you describing this theme, how can that affect how we approach reading Leviticus? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we could uh, we could go back to that sentence about you know uh, a holy God living with His people and teaching them how to um, how to reflect His holiness into the world. But let me come at it from a complementary angle here. Yeah, because as I've read through the book over the years, one of the most helpful metaphors or analogies for me to have in mind is that this is a book telling the story of a king dwelling in the midst of his people. Hmm. So when you come to Leviticus and you go through, what you see is the Lord calls the Israelites to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, So we've got the kingdom language. Who's the king? Well, obviously it's the Lord. And Leviticus makes that clear because of the tabernacle. The way to think of the tabernacle, or at least one helpful way, is to think of it not simply as a tent, but as a portable palace Mm. in which the Lord sits enthroned as king. And so, for example, like a palace, the Israelites with their offerings are bringing their tribute here Mm. to the Lord as king. Um, It's ornate furniture and tapestries inside. There's no tent in Israel that looks like this one, right? This is clearly a tent fit for a king. A king's servants in a normal palace, they wear uniforms. That's how you can tell you're a servant of the king. Well, you get to the tabernacle, what do you see? You see the priests who are all wearing these different uniforms. They're the king's servants. They had a throne room, the most holy place where the Lord sat enthroned as king over the Ark of the Covenant. And so what you're reading in Leviticus is about this holy king dwelling in the midst of his people. Mm. And that helps you in all sorts of ways. Let, Let me give you just one way it helps us with one of the few stories in Leviticus that is often troubling to us when we first read it. So as you go through Leviticus, you get to chapter 10 and you meet two priests named Nadab and Abihu. They are sons of Aaron, who's the high priest. Nadab and Abihu bring this offering to the tabernacle that the Lord hadn't authorized. And as we read the story in the context of Leviticus, it seems what they try to do is go into the most holy place with this offering. Mm -hmm. And what happens as you read through the story is that fire comes out from the presence of the Lord and consumes Nadab and Abihu. Now, we read that from our modern modern context, and we're often thinking, wow, this just confirms the stereotype of God in the Old Testament being an angry God mm. who's just ready to thwack us if we put one little toe out of line. That's how the story can seem to us. But then we remember, okay, how's an ancient Israelite reading this? And an ancient Israelite is understanding that in the most holy place, the Lord's enthroned as king. And an ancient Israelite knows there's a certain protocol that you've got to follow when you're approaching a king in his throne room. And if you don't follow that protocol, it is a severe sign of disrespect. It's treasonous disrespect. Uh, Though it comes from a later time, you might remember the scene in the book of Esther in the Old Testament where Mm -hmm. someone's telling her, go into the king. And she says, I can't go into the king if he doesn't invite me, because if I do, I might get put to death. I mean, right, there's, there's this protocol. And so once we remember these things, all of a sudden... Instead of, uh, while we think, wow, this just shows God's such an angry God, and and we have questions about God's actions, I think an Israelite is looking at this story and saying, what in the world were Nadab and Abihu thinking? Mm -hmm. How could they, as our spiritual leaders, show such profound, treasonous disrespect to the Lord? Mm -hmm. I don't think they're troubled by what the Lord does, I think they're troubled by what Nadab and Abihu have done. Mm -hmm. And it's because they would have a much better understanding, oh, 
the King of Kings dwells in our midst and is worthy of complete respect and praise and honor. Hmm. So he really does place this emphasis on God as King, which mm-hmm. we don't normally, I think if you pulled the average Christian or average person who's aware of the Bible and hears about Leviticus, they don't necessarily go straight to that book as a, it's such this, it's a beautiful look at what it means for as God as King. Right. But when you frame it that way, it's a really great way to approach reading the book. And if you're approaching that book and you pick it up and you start reading, you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to look at this through this lens of God as King. Then all of the laws, all of the rituals, everything around it starts to really put itself into place and you can see it and you're like, Oh, I, I get it. I get why this was so important. And I get what this is saying about who God is, his holiness. Yes, absolutely. And it, it helps like even with something like law, I just said a few moments ago, Leviticus is almost all, all law. Mm-hmm. Well, in the ancient Near East, when you had a king that entered into a covenant relationship with a people, one of the things that you'll see in those covenant documents is he gives them a list of stipulations. And those stipulations help them to know, oh, this is what my relationship with the king is, is to look like. Um, it's it's kind of like vows at a wedding ceremony. Mm. And so even even the the concept of law takes on a different understanding yeah. when you put it into the context of a king entering into covenant with his people. Mm. So we've started talking a little bit about what this book says about God, and maybe this is and it serves the next question as well, but I wanted to offer it up regardless. And you can just say, well, I just answered that. Or you can take right. it in a completely different direction, which you've yeah. been so good at doing in, in, in this conversation. But, but what does Leviticus teach us about God? Sure. I mean, there are so many things that it teaches about God, but let me focus in on one aspect of its teaching in particular, and that is God's holiness. For many years, if you'd asked me, what does it mean to be holy? I would have said to you, well, to be holy is to be morally pure. Mm. That means to have no stain of evil. And so to say that God is holy, to say is that he has no stain of evil and that he's morally pure. Now that's absolutely true. And we praise him because of it. And that's to narrow an understanding of his holiness. It's to narrow an understanding of holiness in general. And here's why. When you go through Leviticus, you find that different things like the altar mm. can be called holy. Now, if, if holy being holy only refers to moral purity, what's going on? You know, you don't call the altar holy because you're thinking, man, that altar has never broken one of the Ten Commandments. That is one (laughs) holy altar, dude. No, that's not what holiness is about. So how do we explain this concept of holiness? I think the best explanation that many scholars have, have talked about is that to be holy is to be set apart. So when the Bible says, for example, consecrate or treat as holy the seventh day, What is the Bible saying? Well, you treat the Sabbath as unique. You set it apart as different from the other days. Um, When we say that the altar was holy, it means you're not to use this to play ping pong on. (laughs) You know, this you're setting this apart. This has a specific use. So to say that God is holy is to say that he is set apart Mm. from us, from everything. He is holy, which leads to the natural question, well, in what way is God set apart? And I mean, the simplest answer is, well, in every way. Yeah. <laughs> he's, just, he's just so perfectly complete in ways that we're not. But Leviticus focuses on three particular ways that God has set apart. Um, first, in terms of his power. So I mentioned the story of Nadab and Abihu, when fire comes out and consumes them. When you read through that story in context, the Lord actually says, verse 3 of chapter 10, among the ones close to me, I will show myself to be holy, Mm -hmm. which is to say this miraculous judgment of power is setting the Lord apart as the king of sovereign power and the one to be respected as such. He is holy in terms of his power. Mm 
Uh, secondly, he's holy in terms of his moral purity. So Leviticus 19 is known as the Sermon on the Mount of Leviticus. When you read through, it has all sorts of laws like um, uh, make sure that you have equal weights and measures. Don't rip people off by using false ones. Uh, the the oppress or don't oppress the blind or the deaf. In other words, Leviticus 19, a big focus of it is live a morally pure life. And the chapter begins this way. You must be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. In other words, because I'm morally pure and upright, you must be as well. Mm. So is moral purity. The third aspect of God's holiness, and this is the one that we don't often think of or connect to holiness, but it is central to his holiness, and that is his love. If you live out the kinds of things that Leviticus 19 is talking about, being just and fair in your business dealings, showing compassion for the disadvantaged. In fact, Leviticus 19 has one of the most uh, quoted verses from the Old Testament, love your neighbor as yourself. And again, how does Leviticus 19 begin? It begins by saying, be holy because I am holy. See, the Lord is completely set apart in terms of how wide and deep and long and strong and explosive is his love. Mm. And what that means is that it doesn't matter how much theology we know, uh, how many rules of the Bible we follow. If we are not overflowing with love, we're not holy because central to the Lord's holiness is his love. Mm. So so we had this great views of what Leviticus teaches us about God. And, and you talked about these three main areas of, of God's holiness, which is great. What does Leviticus then teach us about ourselves, about people? Yeah. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it reminds us of the privilege the Lord gives us of reflecting his goodness, justice, mercy, and love into the world. The fact that the Lord invites us into the story that he's writing for creation is profoundly important for us to understand. I mean, what kind of God does this? This is a God who uh, not simply loves us, but invites us to join him in spreading his goodness, justice, mercy, and love throughout the entire world. Mm. That's a tremendous privilege, and Leviticus teaches us a lot about that. Um, On the other hand, it also reminds us that while we are to do those things, we fail at doing those things. And so we need God to make a way to be cleansed and to be forgiven of our sin. Uh, This is where the concept of atonement is such an important part of Leviticus. Atonement, Mm. my my thumbnail definition of atonement is that atonement means that God in his love makes a way to deal with our wrongs so that we might be made right with him. God in his love, especially in Jesus, we Mm. learn later on in the story, but God in his love makes a way to deal with our wrongs so that we might be made right with him. And Leviticus emphasizes this in so many different ways, but one of my favorites is in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. This is the verse that I say to myself almost every time that I take communion. Mm -hmm. And it goes like this, for the life of the flesh, it's talking about a sacrifice. And why does sacrifice works? And it's saying, well, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I, the Lord is speaking, I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your lives. Mm. For it is the blood uh, by means of the life that makes atonement. And what's so fascinating about this verse is that although it doesn't come through in the English, there's an extra pronoun, there's an extra use of I in the verse. So let me translate it literally. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I I have given it to you on the altar to atone for your lives. 
one Jewish writer has commented that this verse, uh, it reverses how we think about sacrifice. Mm-hmm. We think about sacrifice as something that we give to God. And on the one hand, it, that's how sacrifice works. But in this verse, God is saying, I am the one who has provided sacrifice to you mm-hmm. as a way to atone for your sins. And he underlines, I have done it. Mm. Uh, the New Testament equivalent would be Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. In fact, it takes it to a new level because in the Old Testament, you still brought a sacrifice for your sin. In the New Testament, God gives us the sacrifice for our sin. And and understanding this um, makes the love of God for sinful people so beautifully pure and precious. I, I think it's important, and you're getting into it right now, and I'm going to ask you to keep expanding on this, because for anybody who maybe not have read Leviticus before, it's, We've talked about this as a, a book of a lot of laws and a lot of how to make yourselves right with God. So can you, for the reader, can you explain the old covenant, new covenant in how we as 21st century Christians or any Christian post Jesus time, it, it looks back at Leviticus and reads it. Right. So let me answer that question by talking first just a bit about law and how law works, and then we can get to well, which laws apply today? We're new covenant, we're not old covenant. Law, most of us hear law and we think legalism. Uh, it Law is a negative thing when many of us hear the word. But actually law, properly understood, is a window into the values of the lawgiver. Mm. So think about our laws. Why do we have laws against murder? Because we value life. Why do we have laws against stealing? Because we value the right to private property. Laws are a window into the values of the lawgiver. And what that means, if we have that understanding of law, well, then all of a sudden Leviticus becomes really exciting because it's full of laws from the Lord, which means this is a window into the heart of the Lord. That's one way to think about how to approach the laws in Leviticus. Oh, we have got this great opportunity to learn the Lord's values. So you get to Leviticus 19 and the Lord says, hey, when you're harvesting your field, leave an edge of your field unharvested uh, for the resident alien and for the poor. Why, why does the Lord do that? What's going on? Well, there's a value underneath underneath that or several values. Um, concern for the unfortunate. Uh, the Lord values Um, compassion more than he values you maximizing your personal profit, right? There are all sorts of values that you can learn. There are some laws that are going to be confusing when we read them. What is the value behind don't wear clothing made of two different fabrics? I think there's actually a good answer for that, but it's not always as self-evident to us when we, when we get it or when we first read it. So, so all that to say law, if we think of it as, um, reflecting the values of the lawgiver, that's a super helpful way to read through the laws. Mm-hmm. And it it bridges into the question that you were asking about, we're new covenant people, this is old covenant, how do we think about the relationship between the two? And at the highest level, how I've thought through and explained the answer to that question goes something like this. As New Testament believers were under the new covenant. We're no longer under the old covenant. So when you're reading a law of Leviticus, which is part of the old covenant, you can't immediately assume, oh, this law automatically applies to me today Mm -hmm. in the same way. You can't assume that's the case because we're in the new covenant. But you can't also assume, oh, it doesn't apply to me today. (laughs) And you can't assume that because many of the laws in the Old Covenant are repeated in the New Covenant. Leviticus 19 talks about not stealing and not lying. Leviticus 18 talks about not committing adultery. And so you you can't assume it just doesn't apply in any way whatsoever. And so how do you begin to think about which laws apply and which don't? And 
One of the most helpful ways to think through things is, well, there are some laws that we know we, we don't follow in the same way because Jesus has fulfilled them. So laws about sacrifice or um, certain laws about the priesthood. Jesus is our final priest. Uh, Jesus fulfills the sacrificial system. So we don't make sacrifices anymore. Um, and some laws have been set aside, laws about ritual purity and impurity, right? Those, those laws in the New Testament get set aside. Um, but as you're reading through, lots of laws are, are repeated. And even if they're not, and this is the important thing, because it's a law, there's an underlying value. Mm. And so with the sacrificial system, for example, yeah, I don't have to present a fellowship offering anymore. But when I read the law, I see, oh, but one of the underlying values here is you honor the Lord with your very best. And that helps me as I'm reading through, great, don't have to make the sacrifice, but what does it mean for me today to honor the Lord with my very best? Mm. So that's a, a very high level answer to that question. I go into a bit more detail in the commentaries I've written on Leviticus in yeah. the introduction, um, but at a high level, those are some of the things to keep in mind. Yes, and I will put the links to the commentaries in the show notes for this episode. So if you want to see Dr. Sklar go, go deeper into the commentary, uh, I will put the links to that in the show notes as well. So normally I ask about like the sticky wickets of a book, the things, but but this one kind of covers all that, which is, uh, you know, is looking at the, the law and how do I approach the law at a little bit differently. So, yeah. so I will mark that one as checked in terms yeah. of uh, our normal system of questions for these episodes. So I want to wrap up our conversation on Leviticus with this. And just knowing you, I think you'll have a wonderful answer for this one, not to set yourself up. <laughs> but what is something that everybody should know, but maybe doesn't about Leviticus? I think the main thing that came to my mind as I thought through this question was understanding Leviticus helps you understand the gospel of Jesus more deeply. Mm. When I um, went to England to do my PhD in the book of Leviticus, my wife, Ski, and I, we move over there and uh, we'd been there for about a year. And so every day for a year from like nine to five, I'm reading through Leviticus <laughs> and uh, reading through about atonement and sin and sacrifice and all these things. And towards the end of a year, I found that when I would go to church and a song would go up on the screen that mentioned sacrifice or ransom mm -hmm. or atonement, it was really hard for me to make it through the song without tears coming to my eyes. Mm. And the reason was because studying it in Leviticus helped me to understand so much more deeply the sweetness of what the Lord has done in providing Jesus to us as the final sacrifice, the love that Jesus has shown us in offering himself up on our behalf while we're just full of sin and stained with impurity. And he's exchanging, giving us his righteousness, clothing us with it, that we might be made right with God. Those truths that I had always known became clearer, brighter, and sweeter because of studying Leviticus. Mm. What a beautiful way to look at it. I'm so, I'm, I'm so excited for people because Leviticus has, as, I, as you said, has the reputation of being the Bible reading plan killer. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there is so much beauty in the lens that you look at it through. So when you look at it in this place of God is King and, mm -hmm. and what holiness means. And when you look at it through this lens of atonement and God, flipping the idea of the sacrifice on his head and saying, I am offering this to you as a way to be with me. And when you look at all these laws, these chapters of laws, but you look for the values underneath that, what is this law saying about God's heart and about this value system that he is establishing in these people? 
then it really does change your approach. And you can look at Leviticus not as this drudge, but as something exciting that appeals back these different layers of who God is, what God is saying about himself, and what God is saying about us and the way he made us in the world that he he made and wants us to live in in the best way possible and in that, that so it just adds to this beauty so thank you for helping us to navigate through this book i, I really appreciate it i if you if you wouldn't mind mm. i would love it if you could end our time today by praying for people who are about to read leviticus mm. maybe they have would, not read it before maybe they've never read it before or maybe they've read it before and we're like, uh, and they're going back to it. But would yes. you mind praying for anybody who's about to open up Leviticus? It'd be my pleasure. Heavenly Father, Holy King, the one who loves to be with his people, the one who in love makes a way for our sin and impurity to be dealt with, that we might live in the light and the love of your presence. I pray for those who are reading this book that you would help them to understand more clearly and deeply who it is that you are, who it is that you've created us to be, the mission and privilege that you've given us of reflecting your kingdom into this world, and the glory of the gospel of Jesus, our great high priest, our final sacrifice, the one who has made a way to deal with all of our sin and impurity, the greatest day of atonement that has ever been. We give you praise for him and praise for your love through him and pray in his name. Amen.